Hi, everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. <laughs> you know, I just feel really blessed and fortunate to be sitting here and to be able to be part of this extraordinary little opportunity in a way. I mean, the creation of this universe and, and what it is to be a human being is, is extraordinary and a magical mystery tour for every, everybody if they recognize it. But for in a little way, in a little sense of the magic, to be you know, part of this experiment of bridging heaven and earth that started many, many years ago and has gone through so many iterations and so many different studios and a lot of the same people are here from the very beginning and a lot of people have done a lot of these shows and everybody here has volunteered their time and energy to be part of this grand experiment and what is the grand experiment about it's about really the heart of it is to feel love and share it to spread that vibration of as you saw at the opening as you see on all the bridging flyers that dedicated to the oneness what is the oneness what is that experience that we as human beings can have of something so beautiful and so vast and so connected. And in our hearts, we know we want it. And now opportunities are existing and technology is making things possible that this Bridging Heaven and Earth show that, that we're filming at this little studio in Santa Barbara, California, within months can, can reach the whole world. That these words of mine that this effort of this extraordinary crew of this dedicated volunteer crew can can reach and and the the intent of everyone here is to really be of service and to be serving that love and serving that consciousness and and for that message and that for that vibration to be able to reach through the internet and through the YouTubes and Googles of the world to be able to have those new paradigms available and to have that available to bring that energy of these shows of of the art we're going to show of the the videos we're going to show of, of our incredible guest John Sherman to have that energy available within a month to every corner of the world I mean we know that to be a case because we already have well over 200 shows available and literally every day we get 5,000 people from all over the world reaching out to us and reaching heart, heartfully and, and heartfeltly and joyously and lovingly about wanting more of that experience and wanting more of that love and how can we have it and how can we do more and how can we get that energy and that vibration and, and, and expand and, and enliven that quantum energy so that that experience of connection and oneness is, is real for more and more people on a more consistent basis. How can we stop the insanity that's being perpetuated by the disharmony that so many of us believe in? And, and that's the opportunity that you know, I'm given and, and all these people who have dedicated their day and their weeks to, to, to making this available and then the miracle in a way of the new paradigms and and as we bridge heaven and earth as we are on the bridge we will see that new paradigms like the googles and youtubes that you couldn't imagine that didn't exist five and ten years ago will start to exist and will start to be available and the recognition of the light workers and the light organizations and the healers and the artists and the musicians who at this point perhaps are not recognized for their value to this society, for the value to this planet, will start to be recognized. And that is a great gift and a great opportunity for us. And, you know, whoever is listening to these words, I mean, we have an opportunity to really come together, to really together we can together we can raise that energy and enliven that energy and be together and be collaborative and be creative and, and share our gifts everybody's got so many different gifts and so many different stories and so many different points of light is coming to this point and for us to come together and create a tremendous beam of light to really 
enliven the energies and to lighten this world. I mean, that is a real gift and a real opportunity and a real destiny for us at this time. And our guest tonight, as I mentioned earlier, John Sherman is an extraordinary spiritual teacher who's had, I mean, we've had a lot of guests, and he has had an amazing journey. I mean, his life story, life history, uh, is, is a real unique one, as everyone's is, but if you hear his, I mean, he was a communist, a revolutionary, an anarchist, a bank robber, a bomber. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this guy was involved in a lot of things that you wouldn't think would end up in a spiritual teacher. He was in gunfights with the police. Uh, he was shot. He was captured. He was involved in escapes. He was t two years on the FBI most wanted list. I mean, spent 15 years in prison. And somehow that experience, that gift to him, opened him up in some way, made him experience that truth, that love, that oneness. And now his life is dedicated to going out and teaching and to teach the method of love, of oneness, of achara, to all those who are interested. And that's really what his life's about. And that's his, what his activities are day in and day out, unrelentingly. And uh, as most of you know, we usually have art videos, music videos, and the two tonight, we have an art music video by Lauren Curtis and uh, Mark Shepard, a beautiful art music video. And then we have a video that we've shown, I think, once or twice before, but everybody wants to see it. It's very beautiful, Sean Galloway, I Choose Love. So we have those two videos. And as most of you know, we're in the middle of an extraordinary international art project. It came as a dream, it came as a vision, as a healing, as an acupuncture for the planet. That we, you know, reach out to the world and say, anybody who wants to, any skill level, any format, any size, any country, any age, we have three to, I think, 82 now produce a new original piece based on the theme, Bridging Heaven and Earth. Get those pieces here, create them, and however you create them, with that energy, with that vibration of the healing, of that intention to heal, of that intention to be collaborative and creative in the name of service, in the name of love. We'll put the art pieces on the show. We'll have art, uh, you know, art uh, openings and exhibits around whatever area we can get them in. And we will have an extraordinary art project, uh, art project site, heaventoearthart.com, where the pieces are all there, all the information about the artists, all the countries, they've come in from all over the world. It's a real opportunity. Go there, watch them, see them. See the videos we've done, uh, show 221, Bridging Heaven and Earth show 221. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. You can see art from all over the world. Hear me read poems and and uh, writings from the artist, just an, a real opportunity for us. So we have two paintings tonight, one from Greg McGrath. Uh, he lives in, uh, I think, West Virginia. And uh, Irene Bendikowski, who's a Polish woman who now lives in Germany. And literally, we're getting pieces from all over the world, so you'll see them. They're so beautiful. And so join me in a short meditation, and then we'll have uh, the first video from Lauren and from uh, Mark, so join me in a short video, and then I'll read something that Lauren has written about her video, and then we'll watch that. Thank you. So let me read this. This is Lauren Curtis. She, uh, the art is Lauren's. The music is by Mark Shepard. Uh, it's called Mystics and Mourners. And here's what she wrote about it. We have access now more than ever to vast, vast sources of information and knowledge. This leads many to enlightenment, but can also lead to destructive behavior. While we advance technologically, Often nature suffers, leaving us to mourn the losses of land, wildlife, and natural resources. There needs to be a balance between the quest for knowledge and preserving our environment. This has led me to explore this theme using archetypes that can be found in many cultures, the mystic hermit, the mourner, 
and the tree of life wisdom. Often this leads us to become the mystic when we begin the journey to search for answers to life's mysteries. This nurtures the tree of life wisdom, a universal symbol of knowledge and enlightenment. The more we continue to abuse the gifts of technology and take advantage of nature, the tree withers. By focusing on these ideas through my artwork, I hope to encourage discussion about these ideas. So that's what Lauren wrote. So now her video, you'll see Mystics and Mourners, enjoy. Hi everybody, welcome back. So that was a beautiful video. It's Lauren's art, uh, Lauren Curtis and Mark Shepard's music. So that was beautiful. And the picture you're seeing in between John and I was a piece done for the International Healing Art Project, Balinese Angel, uh, Greg McGrath. He's from, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Great Cacapone, West Virginia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but literally pieces are coming from all over the planet. Just incredibly beautiful pieces. So, and you'll see another one later on. So, welcome, John. I'm glad you're here. Me too. So, we were talking a little earlier, and you were talking about that for the last 5,000 years, we've been going through this thing as a human race. So, why don't you talk a little about 
you know, the, the, what, was, what happened 5,000 years ago and where we are now and, you know, what's doing with the whole process? Well, first of all, you know, it's pretty much common knowledge that being a human being is, life as a human being is life of misery. That sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but that underlying it, there's a sense of uh, something not right, something that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be corrected. And I suspect that that's been the case for as long as there has been human beings. But for the first, oh, I don't know, 50,000 years or so of human beings, what we did about that was try to find help from outside in the form of uh, life forces and animal spirits and tree spirits and rock spirits and things of that nature. A kind of an animistic solution is what we're looking for. And that carried us for about 50,000 years. And about 5,000 years ago, we made a change in the way we were trying to deal with this misery of being a human being. The, not, it's not a big thing, you know? I mean, it's not like, like, oh my God, and I'm in torment all the time. But there's this undercurrent of fearfulness and anxiety that characterize... We're missing something. ...that characterize human experience. And about 5,000 years ago, it occurred to us that perhaps the solution was not to be found on the outside, but to be found on the inside, inward in spiritual, in internal spiritual practice and investigation and the like. And sure enough, as time went on and more and more people began to be involved in this adventure of trying to find a spiritual solution, an inward spiritual solution to our misery and to the sense that life is a false promise and the like, sure enough, over time, a few people began to find themselves free of that underlying misery. A few, here and there, and one time or another. And one of the things that characterized them once they found themselves free of this misery was a great intent to help the rest of humanity also be free of this misery by trying to uh, convey to us what it was that, 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 that fixed them, that got them free, that made it so that they are no longer strangers in their own lives, no longer at the mercy of life. Unfortunately, I suspect since the actual thing that does that is so simple and so really, really simple and easy, I suspect that most of us who have who had found that to be the case, the absence of the anxiety and so forth, looked about at what they were doing when that happened and tried to piece together some coherent understanding of what could be done to everybody else, what everybody else could do to have the same effect, to have the same outcome. Well, the only thing that was at their, at their, uh, at their hands, or at their disposal, was their own current experience of human life. So that what they told us of was what it felt like to them to be a human in which the human life had not been spoiled. That they were compassionate, that they were uh, intimately one with their own life, that they were intimately one with all. That, that the actual nature of reality was too subtle and too uh, too simple, too prior to everything to really to speak of, but to describe, but that this is what we should be doing. We should be loving one another. We should be compassionate. We should be not aggressive, we, you know, like non-harming. We should be accepting of things. We should not resist things, and so forth and so on. The whole uh, spiritual panoply of things that we should be and are not. And over time, we developed practices and, and uh, teachings and things we could do, readings, understandings, and so forth, all of which are designed to evoke those characteristics within our own human consciousness. And these are 
some of them are quite beautiful, and some of them are 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 quite uh, have some force. But when we look at the history of the spiritual uh, aspirations of humanity over these five thousand years or so, whether we look at it in the sense of you know kind of the advanced Advaita teachings or religious teachings or any other kind of spiritual or metaphysical teachings, we have to see that actually there's only been a handful of us that have truly, truly been finished with this underlying undercurrent of misery and anxiety, of fear of life, of a sense that there's something wrong, that I'm trapped here, I'm at the mercy of my life, that I'm at stake here, and that I have to do something right. Only now I've found something right to do that is endorsed and blessed by the most wonderful beings on the planet. So I try. I do my meditation practice. I do my pranayama. I do the tang ling. I do all that stuff. And sure enough, it has some effect. But never gets to that anxiety and fearfulness. And the truth is that almost for almost all of us that enter that realm, our efforts to, be, to, uh, to do these things is driven by the same thing that has driven us all along, this sense that there's something wrong. There's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with me and there's something wrong with you. I don't know what I should get. I don't know what I should hold on to. I don't know what I should want. I don't know what I should not want. I don't know what I should be, and I look frantically around for some clues, some ideas of what I should be and what I should get and what I should think and what I should feel and so forth, and try to do that. But that's our whole lives. That's not just in the spiritual realm. That's in every realm. That's what we do. If, any, if this were any other realm of human activity and aspiration, and we looked at the billions of people, literally billions of people, who have been involved in this kind of activity over 5,000 years, and looked at the actual number of individual persons that have actually fallen away or seen the end of this fearfulness and anxiety, we would call it a failure. Would say, frankly... Or government. Our government, right. <laughs> something, something that's horribly that's not right. working. That's right. It doesn't work. But because it's spiritual right. and religious and metaphysical and endorsed by great beings, we naturally conclude that it's just me. I'm just not doing it right. And maybe, I don't, maybe I'll never be able to do it right because it's just me. It's because of things that I've done in past lives or because of uh, just fate, or just because I'm stupid, because I'm a bad person, I'm sinful. But I would say that the truth is that we've just been on the wrong track. Now, I stumbled upon spiritual teachings while I was in prison. In 1994, I first was, uh, and at that time I was, at that time I'd been 15 and a half years in. I was, I ended up staying 18 and a half years in prison. I'd been 15 and a half years in prison and uh, was not interested in much of anything. I pretty much had concluded, I had had my time in the past when I was on fire with one thing or another to become the person that I ought to be and redeem yeah, and, and fix all the wrongs in myself. Right. Right. But I had seen that most of that was, had been kind of worn away by the years in prison and the, hope, and the hopelessness and the, the, the clear seeing that nothing I had done had any effect whatsoever on me or anything else. That I was still the same miserable individual as I had ever been, and I would doubtless die the same miserable individual that I had ever been, and that 
that was just that, just the way it is. I played tennis. I, you know, I... Yeah, you had stuff to fill, I, yeah, busyness. Did what I yeah, had to right. do. But uh, I had really come to the point where it was apparent to me that I could do nothing, that it was just a waste of time, that life sucked, and that was all there was to it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And then I came in contact with, uh, uh, in, very, in a very short period of time, I came in contact with a spiritual teacher who came into the prison, whose name was Gangaji, and, uh, and just got kind of blown away by her. And I also came in contact with people who were coming in from, I was at that time was in a prison, federal prison in Colorado, and people who were coming in from Naropa from uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's uh, people, uh, bringing Tibetan Buddhism into the prisoners. And I said, wow, this is it. Now I see what I should have been doing. I wasn't sure whether I, what I should have been doing was doing what Gangaji said or what I should have been doing was doing what the Buddhists said, but I could see that there was something there. There was where salvation lied. And I became very, I learned a lot. I read a lot. I read you had plenty of time. Plenty of time and <laughs> for somehow plenty of material. And for a year, for a good long year, I was given huge experiences of openness and emptiness and, and uh, the oneness of all being and and infinite and eternal love, and and uh, I had written that uh, the stones in the prison sang arias of being to me, silent arias of being, and it was like that. And I, I don't mean to disparage that, right? Because it was real. No, and it was, it was part very, of what brought you to this. Very moment. powerful. Right. And then after a year, I lost it all. It all went away. And instead of returning me to the state of a kind of, of a resigned, benevolent resignation, it threw me straight into hell. And I was, uh, I was, uh, I, I've never been as, as tortured and tormented as I was in the year that followed that first year of heaven. You speak about heaven and earth, this is, or heaven and earth, this was heaven and hell. And I was so, I was so tormented and I was so tortured that I was determined to find some way to at least see through what had happened to me, at least see what had happened to me. And I finally came to the, to the sense, to the understanding that at that heart of everything that had been so powerful in my life was the teachings of Ramana Maharshi. I had read the books, ta the book Talks with Ramana Maharshi through many times. And I, and I could see that he was on to something that wasn't the same. That was, and in fact, in his time when he was alive, the gurus in Tiruvannamalai all were opposed to him and told their, their students, don't go near him, he'll ruin your practice, he's no good for you. And I could see that he was onto something different. Now for those who don't know about Ramana, Ramana, when he was a 16-year-old boy, not religious, not spiritual, his father died unexpectedly young. And Ramana, in the, in the, uh, the, psychological torment that attended his father's death and the appearance of the certainty of death in his own life, decided that he would pretend to be dead. Now, of course, in the intervening years, much has been, much of a layer of spirituality and so forth has been put on that time when he pretended to be dead. But if you read his own account of it, you find that all he did was pretend to be dead. And it wasn't even very sophisticated. 
he lay down, he stiffened his body, he imagined himself being ta taken to the burning cot, he imagined the the body being destroyed and so forth. I mean, it, but it was just a, 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 a an imagining. And he later said that what he came to see in that moment was that the, f and this is surprising for anybody who's familiar with Advaita and familiar with the fact that Advaita has tried to, to capture Ramana. What he said was that what remained was the force of person. That's what he said. He left his home. He stole some money from his uncle and he went to Tiruvannamalai, to the temples in Tiruvannamalai, for the purpose, he later said, of reading the sacred books to find out what had happened to him. And he did. And he spent 12 years in Tiruvannamalai, many of them in the temples, all of them in silence. Later, he would, he would tell people that he had taken a vow of silence, Malna, but later he said that he was just lying. He just yeah, didn't, didn't want to speak, it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's always better when you take a vow. Right. But let's get back to this. Okay. Let's watch the second video. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the second so, video. No, 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 it's great, really. <laughs> but I can't take a vow of silence. Uh, so, uh, I Choose Love, Sean Galloway, a beautiful video. And also, let me read this about the painting you're seeing now. It's Irene Bendikowski, Love Between Heaven and Earth. It's an acrylic on canvas. Irene is Polish and lives in Brühl, Germany. And this is what she says about love between heaven and earth. The picture as shown I have named Love Between Heaven and Earth. It describes the connection between heaven and earth. The spiral staircase leads up to heaven from the earth, bringing forth the love of the universe back to the earth. At the top of the picture is the divine eye of God looking down. So that's the Irene Bendikowski, Love Between Heaven and Earth picture you're seeing. And now the video, Sean Galloway, I Choose Love, enjoy.
Hi everybody, welcome back. So Sean, thank you, that was a beautiful video. I Choose Love, Sean Galloway. And the picture you're seeing in between us now is the one we read the little poetry before. Irene Bendikowski from Germany, Love Between Heaven and Earth, so beautiful. So John, you were talking about <laughs> the, the non-vow of silence, take a bite. So why don't you talk a little more about that? Okay, so in any event, I, it, I concluded that if I could find out what Rama actually was suggesting that we do because Ramana is just like everybody else, right? He's not a, not a God creature. He's not a, none of that. He's a human being who as a 16 year old boy stumbled upon freedom from fear, freedom from human misery. He didn't know what happened to him. What, what convinced you that he of all the people you studied was one who had overcome the, the fear? It wasn't so, no, I don't think he's the only one that's overcome the fear. But, but the one that was, you struck as, as one that you wanted to... I'm not sure. Oh, I'm, not I'm sure. really not sure. Oh, okay. um, right. I, I, it would be a waste of time to try to figure But you out. had a sense that he had overcome fear. I, no, I had a sense that he actually, that I could, that I actually could hear from him what it was that actually happened to him. Okay through all of the, and, and I knew Duna what it was. He was extremely erudite. He knew everything there was to know about Advaita and Vedanta teachings and all the teachings that have uh, arisen in India through all these thousands of years. And he talked about them freely. He talked about the practices freely. He tried to help people when they came to him wanting help in their religious or spiritual or, or any of the other practices. But it was obvious that that was actually beside the point of what he was trying to get them to see. And that he knew it was beside the point, and he had an idea of what it was he was trying to get them to do. But he, you know, like, and who knows? I mean, all I read was English translations of it. But I could see that he had an entirely different relationship to spiritual aspiration and spiritual utterance than, than others had. The Buddhists, the, the uh, Advaita people. All and something that. about that really resonated with Really you. resonated with me, that there was something different here. So I determined that I would find out what Ramana was actually suggesting that we do. And of course, what Ramana always came back to was who? For whom is this problem? For whom is this pleasure? For whom is this confusion? For whom is this clarity? And so forth. He would 
talk to people freely, help them with their spiritual understanding and so forth, but then always come back to the same thing. Who? Who? What is this I? Where is this I to be found? What does it feel like? What does it look like? He even made such really kind of uh, heretical suggestions as that we should grab ego by the throat and hold on to it and not let go of it, which is heresy in the more advanced spiritual teachings who, which know, of course, that there is no such thing as ego, therefore, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. So I would, because I was miserable, I would spend every spare moment, and I, actually I had a kind of an easy time of it because so I... was being fed and clothed. Being fed and clothed, and also I wasn't even required to work because I, they decided that I knew too much about computers to work around computers. That you would, yeah. And, and there's computers everywhere, so they gave me a little job of cleaning the staff bathroom in the staff lounge, which I dispensed with in the morning and then had the rest of the time right. to myself. So I would sit on my bed, on my bunk, and I would try to direct my attention to what it was Ramana wanted me to see. Now, I was persuaded at the time that the purpose of this was to discover and understand the truth of my nature. That's what I thought to be the case. And I thought this was the road in. I would sit on my bunk, and in fact, at times I had, I, for a long time, I was following his instruction to grab ego by the throat, and I would find some bodily sensation somewhere that seemed to answer to the name of ego. ego right. It seemed to be a kind of a, a concentration of selfishness and infantile uh, fear and all of that stuff, and I would hold on to it and grab it and hold it, and I would say, because I thought that what the problem was, was ego, I would say, die, die, die. i direct every ounce of energy I could toward killing this thing. Good luck. Until finally, <laughs> one day, I'm sitting there saying, die, die, and all of a sudden I just burst out laughing because it became apparent to me that this, this thing ain't never going to die. Right. Good luck with right. that. Right. Right. No, I understand. Now I continued trying to do what Ramana said. I continued as I went through my days and I went for the, to the mess halls and I went to play tennis and I went to be with people and so forth. I would try always to find some way to bring my attention back looking for I, expecting that sooner or later I was going to get the direct understanding of the nature of what I am. And that direct understanding would, like a tidal wave, wipe away all my confusion and replace it with clarity and, and uh, peace and so forth. That's the plan. And of course, that didn't happen. Not like that. But over time, I began to notice that actually I felt pretty good. And that actually I couldn't find anything all that wrong. Not even with the things that used to seem so wrong, like my greediness and my, you know, uh, selfishness and, and my stupidity and my confusion. Gradually, over time, and it was unnoticeable almost, I began to notice that actually things were okay and that nothing really was hurting me at all, that not my greediness, not the aggression, not the resistance, not the, the sense of being lost and alone, although that sense was there, I began to, to notice that that really wasn't causing me any pain or damage whatsoever. It was just a thing that had appeared and would disappear. And over time, and I came out of the joint, finally, right? I came out of the joint in 1999, and 1998, actually, and uh, Carl and I married in 1999, and we immediately, against everything we wanted to do, we found ourselves unable to do anything except go around and talk to people about this, go around and, and, and become one of the wandering band of spiritual teachers 
that now is like a kind of like a plague of locusts on the land. And we didn't want it. We wanted to do something else, but we couldn't do anything about it. It was the only thing that actually was happening, the only thing that actually was called for. Everything else we tried fell to pieces. So I began to set to myself the goal of finding a way to do what had not been done in my knowledge before, and that was actually to see what it was that had happened to me and whether it was not possible for other people to happen to other people without having to go through the torment that I went through, the stupidity and the, all of that that I went through. And I found that the only way that I could clarify this in, in this uh, consciousness, in this individuated consciousness in my mind, the only way I could come to clarity about it was not by sitting by myself and contemplating and going into samadhi, and not by reading all of the books, which I had already read anyway, but by going out and talking to people about it. I found that the more I talked to people about it, the clearer my own understanding of what had taken place began, became. And finally I came to see, and this was about two years ago, I came to see that although I, although I could see where from comes all of the teachings and the aspirations, and I can see how they have a certain validity to them, that really they are beside the point in the, in the desire to be free of the sense of being trapped in your own life. That they were, that, that, that all of those things, all of the, 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 the cultivation of compassion, the cultivation of dispassion, the cultivation of all of that, that all of those things were treating the symptoms, trying to treat the symptoms, and as we treat one symptom, another one pops up. And we talk about it as you heal the leaf, but the root is rotten, right. so it's not right. going to work so well. And I finally came to see, Alan, that what had happened to me was this. Somehow, in my flailing about, trying to find what Ramana was saying, and trying to follow his instructions, somehow I kind of did that, but not as I thought. Somehow, in all of that activity, I had actually, over time, brought my attention briefly, repeatedly, to contact with my actual nature. Yeah, I think you rub up against the magnet enough in whatever way, and you realize that you're the magnet. But you, yeah, but you snow. See, it's not that. That's well, not what well, I Well, explain it. Explain it again. If, the pro if what I say is true, that the problem is that false fear that arises at the birth of self-consciousness, then the only solution to that can be the truth. If the problem is a wrong inference about my nature, which is to say my nature is vulnerable and subject to be harmed and beat up and so forth, if that's the problem, then the only solution to that must be the reality of my nature. I'm not understanding it because all of that understanding is part of the sickness itself. Right. The, it's it's coming from the wrong place. The you're never, you're not going to understand it. But just the contact with it. Right. Just that. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. If you right. Would... That the contact with reality dissolves the lie. Right. Not in a way that is consciously seen, not in a way that produces some immediate uh, uh, gratification or effect, but it just dissolves the lie, and as the lie is shown false, the fear begins to be snuffed out in the words of the Buddha. And as the fear diminishes and goes away, its effects go away. Now, of course, you know, these minds, these lives, they unfold in their own context. They are, they are formed, our personalities are our, uh, our opinions of things, the way we relate to things. This is all formed as a result of cause and effect within consciousness, the different things all working together to produce this particular persona and this particular set of strategies to protect itself and so forth. The biggest cause is the energy of fear that arises that makes us always looking outward, 
always looking out, we're trying to find a solution. And when that goes away, well, the stupid stuff doesn't vanish in a blaze of light, but deprived of that cause, it just doesn't turn yeah, up. Yeah, the so momentum much. changes. It just doesn't turn up. The traits that are valuable and useful and true, love for one another, compassion and so forth, they thrive in the absence of fear. The traits that are self-destructive and useless and valueless, like resistance and aggression and all of that, they just stop turning up. That's all. And even when they do turn up, there's no sense that they are... The, the, the belief that any of this touches me is gone. Gone. So that the internal warfare that keeps me ever alert to be conscious when wrongness appears so that I can know what it is and get rid of it, and be conscious when rightness appears so I can know what it is and become it or hold on to it, that whole, that whole orientation vanishes. And the, the, the uh, alienation from our own life vanishes. The separation from our own life is gone. And all lives. And all lives. And there you have it. There you have it. And what I have found and what I suggest to people, and I don't know how to speak about this in a way that's really instructive and very, very uh, effective. But what I tell people is look at yourself. You know, I don't, I mean, you can argue about what that means and all of that stuff, but if you will take it, if you will take upon yourself the intent, and this is something that doesn't cost you anything, and it's not anything like where you're going into a trance or you have to give up your firstborn child or anything. It's something that only you can do. Nobody can do it for you. But I tell people that if you will take it upon yourself, take upon yourself the intent you just catch the briefest glimpse of your own nature, if you will see that you are, right now, the actual you-ness of you, we don't get into fancy spiritual distinctions, the actual you-ness of you right now is exactly the same as it was when you were five. If you can think back to an experience when you were a child and what it felt like to be you at the heart of that experience, you will see that it's exactly the same as what it feels like to be you now. And if you will do that, it will continue, and you will not fail. And, and you will see that there's something really constant in your life, and really real. Right, but even if you don't see that, even if you don't know that you have had the glimpse, you, you can't fail. The outcome will be the same. It's got, well, it's got to be better. It's got to be an improvement. That's right. The misery will be gone. <laughs> the truth is, we've got to, this is the end of this bit. We said we'd come to the end of this. All right, so if you want any information about John, call me, Alan, 805-687-2053. Anything about the art project, anything about the videos, anything about anything you want, just call me, Alan, 805-687-2053. Good night. God bless you.